Well, let me get let me get us started here, you. All. I want to welcome everybody. Um, if if y'all don't mind, if you could, everyone show yourself just for a little bit, just so we can see at least see your beautiful faces, uh, and then y'all can go away if you want. That's fine too. Tiersa, wonderful. How are you? Everybody Hello. Great. Look at everybody. Lauren, Daniel, Professor Matthew Wright in the house. Thank you, Owen Anderson. Kiva, nice to see you. Alex, Gwen, thank y'all all for showing up, um, for, for coming. Um, that's all. I just wanted to be able to lay eyes on you a little bit. First and foremost, I want to really thank Ron for taking the time out of the day. Ron is one of my favorite people on the planet. Uh, you know, we've known each other for a little while now, uh, and I just feel really honored for him to, you know, take his time to come in and be with us this afternoon. Ron is one of the really premier producers in New York and in, in film and Sundance film has really made a name for himself on Broadway and at the Sundance Film Festival. He's, you know, garnered a number of Tonys uh as well as final selections at sundance film festival um and really is an artist who came out of a, as an actor emerged as an actor and then you know moved into producing uh and restarted his own company simon says entertainment which is really committed to telling stories of people who are have been marginalized or who have not really who have been kind of not really garnered the attention that they that they require specifically people of color and LGBT LGBTQ stories. So um, he's really doing very very important work in in uh, in Hollywood and on Broadway. Um, you know, and I've titled this our conversation. Ron, I will just start talking. And uh, I've titled it How to Rebuild Broadway, you know, although, Ron, I'm not exactly, you know, I'm not put giving, expecting you to give us the keys and tell us exactly how to do that. But really, you know, kind of centering our conversation a little bit in terms of like, we all know that we're in this crazy moment of, of transformation, you know, and I think there's kind of a big question and excitement and a fear of what comes after this moment, you know, how, you know, we know that the lights are turned off on Broadway. What happens when, when the lights get turned back on? What what looks the same and uh, what might look different, you know, so that's just a little bit of, of, of how we're going to kind of center our conversation. Um, but thank you. Thank you, Ron. Of course, glad wanna... to be here. So, you know, one, if you could just talk about, you have such an interesting story, brother, coming from Detroit all the way to New York City. And I just wonder if you could just talk a little bit about how you became interested in theater. You know, how did, how did that even come about in your life? Well, um, you know, when I was growing up, my mother would take me to see plays that toured and came to Detroit, uh, mostly, not exclusively, but a number of them were the Chitlet Circuit um, plays, you know, Arms Too Short to Box with God and, you know, all of the other, of that ilk. Um, so I really enjoyed live theater from a very early age, like eight, nine, ten years old. And then when I got to high school on a fluke, I don't remember why, I decided to audition for a show that the drama club was doing at my school called the Harlequins and I got cast and um and then something bit me and I was like oh this is kind of cool I like this this is you know I think it was as much storytelling as ego because I loved getting the attention and people were just like oh my god you're so great oh you're so oh you're so and that really fed my ego so I think early on it was it was it was equally ego as well as the experience later on we, I had to let all our ego go. I had to go <laughs> long dead for me, rest in peace. Um, and then when I got to college, I studied uh, basically a double concentration in English, which was mostly theater arts, because they didn't have theater arts, and then um, computer science, what was called back then information systems. Because there are two things that you keep me up late at night. I could work on computers, programming them. That was, I just find that's just fascinating and very engaging and challenging in all the right ways. And then theater, like reading plays, analyzing text, you know. I didn't do a lot of acting while I was in college, but I did a lot of performance study. So mm -hmm. that kept me connected, you know. And then when I graduated college, um, it, was, it was a toss up. I was like, on the one hand, I wanted to go and get a job that paid well because my 
grandparents had retired and my mom was about to retire. But then on the other hand, I really wanted to be an actor. So I started my application at the Yale School of Drama. Um, but I didn't finish it because I finally decided that, you know, I, I really got to, actors may or may not get paid. And who knows when they would get paid. It's a crapshoot. Mm -hmm. um, working at Hewlett Packard is not. So I took the job at Hewlett Packard. And then funny enough, about a week later, I got this call. It's like, is this Ron Simons? I said, yes. Hi, Ron, this is Catherine, blah, blah, blah. And I'm the director of admissions at the Yale School of Drama. And I was like, oh, hello. <laughs> and she said, um, well, as you know, the deadline is passed for applications, but we were so enthusiastic about the uh, part of the package that you sent in that we'd like to extend the deadline for you. And I was like, oh, wait, does that mean I might get in? I think I might be able to get, I, I can't afford to get in anyway, but I mean, I mean, my mind was spinning, 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 spinning. And while my mind was spinning, I was talking, I was saying exactly what I just said to you. Grandparents, retired mother, blah, 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 blah. And I told them that I took a job at HP. And as I, when my mouth ran out of words to say, she said, <clears throat> well, I'm sure you're gonna be very successful in your career. We sorry you won't be joining the fall class, but we wish you all good luck. And she hung with the phone. <clears throat> and I sat there and I remember looking at the wall and thinking, what the fuck? To, pardon my surprise. If, you, if you're offended by cursing, sorry. No, we are. We call it. Just, <laughs> uh, and, and, but I finally, after God knows how long, said, well, that, that's a sign from God. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but one day I'm going to become an actor. And 19 years later, I applied and got into University of Washington where we met and my career started. That's truly amazing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, but you know, you, you you did a big jump there now, brother. So, because between uh, uh, University of Washington and graduating from undergraduate, you know, what, what took you out to the Pacific Northwest? Well, when I graduated from college, I went and worked uh, for Hewlett Packard as a software development engineer. Mm -hmm. And I was there for a few years, and then I got recruited to uh, become a knowledge engineer at this artificial intelligence-based systems. And uh, I developed AI software for F500 companies. And then when I took my head up out of the sand again, I was trying to decide whether I should go and get an MBA in marketing or continue in the world of AI. And the company that I was working for really wanted me because half the executives there got their PhDs at Stanford and they all wanted me to go get a PhD in computer science. Um, and I was like, I, no, because I, my, my whole career in technology, I was always taking st a step away from the technology, right? Because when I first started coding, I was literally coding in registers, zeros and ones at IBM. Mm -hmm. Tedious work. Graduated to, you know, structured languages, you know, Fortran, C, you know, object-oriented programming, blah, blah, blah. But all of that was moving me further and further away. So I finally ended up going to get my MBA in marketing back at Columbia here in New York. Mm -hmm. And then when I graduated from there, then I went out to work for Microsoft. And mm -hmm. I spent a number of years there as a marketing manager, um, overseeing the marketing for what is now Microsoft Mail and scheduling product that you probably are aware of and may use on your campus, not sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and then one day I said, well, okay, now it's time. Mm -hmm. I, if I'm gonna become an actor, I need to do it right now. And mm -hmm. so I went to grad school at 39. I graduated, I guess that means I graduated at uh, 41, 42. And uh, by far the oldest person in the class, like the average age in my class was like 24 and <laughs> here I am, 41. Uh, and I had, a, I, had, I, had, I had an issue about that for a long time because most people who were my age actors had been acting for 20 years and I didn't have that experience, 20 mm -hmm. years of acting. But I finally realized that actually life experience counts for something in the theater. So mm -hmm. I was living my life. So I felt I was okay and I've done all right so far, knock on wood. Um, but I just didn't want to be those people, that person who was like, you know, I wanted to be try acting and well, and then I got sucked into corporate America because I knew that if I didn't leave Microsoft, when I left Microsoft, I was, my trajectory was very clear, executive suite, corporate America. And I was like, I really don't want to do that. I really don't. Mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. Wow, that's a big even leap. Even if I fail, even if I fail yeah. at acting, at least I gave it a try. Yeah, yeah. 
So and producing, would- by the way, was nowhere near at all. Not, I didn't even remotely consider that at all. I didn't so at the time, you weren't thinking of producing at all. You were just thinking, okay, I'm going to go to school for acting now. You went to University of Washington, got an MFA in acting, and then now it's time you head to New York. Right? Yes. So then how, I guess, did you get to, towards producing? Well, um, as I was acting, um, a number of years, I just got, honestly, a little tired of the productions that I was seeing, you know, getting greenlit. And I was, you know, the, 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 the roles that I was going out for were often so stereotypical, which started back in Seattle. And I remember I auditioned for this television show. And the first two auditions I had were uh, a drug dealer and a pimp. Mm-hmm. And so I was on stage here in New York in uh, this play called uh, Ain't Supposed to Die a Natural Death at the mm-hmm. Classical Theater of Harlem. And I was playing this fat, overweight, depressed black man. And I was in the middle of the song and I was like, uh, is this the kind of stories actually you want to tell? Mm-hmm. And then it went away, I kept acting. And then it just planted the seed. And then a couple weeks later, I'm like, yeah, I think you should try to help bring the stories you want to see to mm-hmm. life. And I thought that meant producing, having no clue what producing is, but I said, that, I think that's what they do. Mm-hmm. And so I said, just woke up and I said, okay, I'm a producer, everybody. And then people start sending me stuff. Uh, well, let's dig into that. I mean, cause you're, I think a lot of people don't really know what a, a producer is, you know? And I'm wondering if you could tell us again, what is a producer? And maybe also like, how has your, your role as a producer changed over time or is producing are you do you know producing the exact same way you were producing when you started or now is it changing a little bit well when i first started producing let me give the structure of what producing looks like um, on broadway so there are people called co-producers and they are the people who bring money to the table it could be their money it could be somebody else's money um and there is a body of people in fact if you look at a playbill You'll see, you'll open it, it'll say at the top the name of the theater. It'll have the lead producers on top, usually one to three, maybe five. Then it'll have this big block right underneath them. Those are co-producers. Um, and they might have a couple of stragglers down below, which are like associate producers. But I became a co-producer, which meant I brought money to the table for production. And the co-producers serve as a sounding board for the lead producers. So we have meetings, regularly and we talk about what the ad campaign is going to be what does the television commercial going to look like we listen to the um the spot for radio you know we, we get drafts of what the new york times um advertising is going to be and so and then we give feedback to the lead producers about what we see what we hear what we think blah 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 but at the end of the day it's the lead producers who have ultimate responsibility they know they can consult with us and they can ignore everything that we say but they are the decision makers. So I did that for a number, up until this year, I was a co-producer. And then this year, I stepped into the role of lead producers um, for three shows, which was stupid, silly, and I can't believe I did it, but that's all right, because I'm a blessed man because of it, because the shows that I got going on are off the chain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what lead producers do, just for your information, is they are what I think of as the CEO of the organization. They drive everything. They find the content, they develop the content, they set up the workshops, the readings, you know, they negotiate an agreement with the regional theater to have everyone out of town. They hire the lawyers, they hire the actors, they hire the cat, or the crew, they hire the marketing firm, the advertising agency, the press social media, they do everything. We create the entire team that it takes to move the show to Broadway and keep it running. Mm -hmm. Um, So they are sort of like COO, maybe CFO, could be CEO. But the issue issue is is the buck stops with the lead producer. Mm -hmm. And the way that the playbill works is that the people above title are eligible for Tony Awards. So if you're a co-producer, you're eligible for a Tony Award should this show be fortunate enough to garner one. Mm. And then if you're a lead producer, um, you of course are also eligible. The difference between the two is that lead producers, if uh, the show wins a Tony, they don't have to buy their Tony Award. But these four Tonys back here, I had to buy them, <laughs> pay for them. Wow, each, I didn't know that. Each, like 
17. They are they keep going up in price, you know, but and it really upsets me because I'm like, I won the award, but I gotta pay you to get the award. Is that right? And that really bothers me, right? But um, who's gonna win a Tony Award and not have the Tony Award? You know, like I want a Tony. Oh, let me see it. Oh no, it was too expensive. I, I got the paper. Do you get the paper at least or something that that says it? I don't know. You get nothing. Mm -hmm. Not I. you get a pen that says Tony Award nominee. Mm -hmm. So you do get that. That's for free. Mm -hmm. But by and large, everything else costs money. If you want to go to the Tony Awards, you got to buy your ticket if you're a co-producer. Mm -hmm. Oh, if you want to, oh, you want to go to the after party for like the Tony, the Tony Awards have an after. Yeah, that's four hundred dollars a person. That ain't free. <laughs> it costs a lot of money to win a Tony. Mm, wow, things we don't think about. I didn't think about it either. In fact, that when they, they told me that I got to pay, and I was like, I don't understand. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't understand. But now, how do I guess on the Tonys? I guess currently, I mean, how do you think the Tonys are doing? You know, I mean, what do you think they're doing well, and what do you think they're maybe not doing so, or you know, where they might need a little work? How do you? You know, I never really thought about that. I feel like when I see the Tony Awards, because they are it's an um it is completely driven by members uh of the community so there are people who you know there's a nominating committee and then there's a tony voters and so i can't say that oh they didn't you know vote the right although i have said that the right show to get the tony award the fact of the matter is it's not an organization that makes that decision it's the people in the community who decide who gets nominated and then at the other day who wins the tony award mm -hmm. um i would say that one thing that again i really have a problem with buying an award i would really like to have someone underwrite that i don't know who that is because i think that's just mm -hmm. absurd and obscene right um, but by and large i think that what i have an issue with is not so much the tony awards but the industry itself because I I know that there are there's not enough um, equity, diversity or inclusion on Broadway. You mm -hmm. know that's why this whole letter that was you know sent out by the 400 artists about BIPOC and and a list of a litany of of issues that need to be addressed. Um, mm -hmm. And some of them are being worked on and some are not. I know now, for example, you know there's a time on Broadway where when a black show. Uh, gets a Tony, uh, sorry, not a Tony, but a theater on Broadway, then that's the black show for that season. Mm -hmm. And people have been told when they had another black show, oh no, we've already, we, there's already a black show. So you have to come mm -hmm. back next year. Mm -hmm. And then this year, it's fundamentally different. I've actually become very, my projects are becoming very attractive to theater owners because they are really invested in being, in being seen as you know, inclusionary, after, especially after George Floyd and the whole anti-racist movement that, that that took off after his uh, murder. So it's the first time that I have three black shows, and it looks like all of them are going to find Broadway births, and that's because the theater owners are like, we need this content. I, I Both the theater, the the not-for-profit theaters, got black shows coming in. You know, the theater owners, the Schubert's are dedicated to getting black folks in the door. Mm -hmm. um, and so is, you know, everyone else. So th that, th that is being addressed now. I'm mm -hmm. really happy to say that that, that uh, the content that makes it to Broadway is diversifying. Hopefully it won't just be a fluke for a year or two, but it will be part of an ongoing process. Mm -hmm. um, that's, yeah, that's exciting. For those of you all out there, if you all remember Keenan and Keenan Scott, was just with us a couple of weeks ago. His show, Ron, is the lead lead producer. Are you lead lead producer on Keenan Scott's show, Thoughts of a Colored Man, which is headed to Broadway? So you know, a small small world. It is, and we just announced today, Dateline, that we have a Schubert House to open that good girl. Now, do you do you have a date? No, we don't. Anybody's gonna give you a date when, when Broadway is going on, you'll know one thing, they're lying. They don't know what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> Nobody knows Nobody nothing. Knows right now. Well, I wonder if you could talk to our young students in terms of a little bit, what is, um, you know, I mean, people, we have people who are aspiring to write the next Broadway hit, 
right? We have some really talented people here, but I'm but really like, what is the trajectory? How does a show, you know, get developed and make it to Broadway? Is it just you write a great musical, you give it to Ron Simons, and then he's producing it on Broadway? Is that how that works? <laughs> there's no one path to Broadway, number one. Mm -hmm. um, with the possible exception, there's a formula that Disney has, you know, for bringing their content, but they already have the content. They, you know, it's already branded, blah, blah, blah. So let's just put that aside for a moment. Mm -hmm. But for um, new playwrights or work that has not yet been created, it's, a, it's an iterative process, mm -hmm. right? So someone writes a great play, <clears throat> then they have to work on it for a number of years. Like, so they'll do a reading and then they'll do another reading and then they'll have a workshop and then they'll have another one and then they have another reading. And somewhere in that process, when it's just about soup, they have a backers audition, which is to say it's another reading where you invite people like funders, producers, folks who have the capacity to actually develop the work. Mm -hmm. um, and people, producers will find content there. And sometimes they'll literally come up to the writer at the end of it and say, so I love this show and I really want to help develop this. And then they begin the process of taking it to the next level, which is to say, you know, getting it in front of not-for-profit theaters that, you know, producers like, like me work with, right? And, you know, have, setting up an out-of-town run. If the, if the piece needs some more work, then the producer shares that with the writer and or the, and the whoever all the creatives are. Mm -hmm. And then the path begins. Not every show is a Broadway show, but, and it's the a producer who is to look at a property and says, I think this is commercial enough to be successful on Broadway. And I think it'll do very well. Mm -hmm. um, and so to get it to that place, it's a multi-year effort. Because after the producer says, I am going to be your champion, I'm going to take this piece and we're going to develop and we're going to bring in the right people. We're going to find the director to, that, that makes sense for this. We're going to find the actress who makes sense for this. We're going to find all the people who need to support you, the creative, of getting it from this point to the point where it's going to open in a theater. Usually, again, out of town or off Broadway. That could be New York Stage and Film. That could be New York... Uh, theater workshop, that could be second stage, it could be any number of not-for-profit theaters. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you get that good girl programmed into a season, then you start looking for Broadway, if you feel like Broadway is the next step for the piece. Mm -hmm. And then you have to start doing all the things that it takes to, to uh, move the show from off-Broadway or out of town to Broadway, which is to say raise millions of dollars, Hmm. and also find the right creative team. Because some a lot of times the creative team that produced it or created the work for it, except for the writer, of course, off-Broadway doesn't transfer with it to Broadway. And that's a question that the producers have to grapple with. Is this the right person? Is this the right team to make this thing be the best thing that it can be on Broadway? Hmm. So in addition to raising money, well, then you... Um, you, you want to start promoting the piece to co-producers, like people, like I said, I did for the you know number of years in my career, because you then want to have um, readings or invite producers to go see your show at the Arena Stage in D.C. or see a repertory theater or La Jolla out in Southern California, right? So you're you're trying to build the um, not, not so much the audience, but you're trying to build the funders and producers who are gonna take this across the finish line. Mm -hmm. And then once you raise how much money, 5 million, 7 million, 17 and a half million, 65 million, whatever the thing is, um, then it's just about getting a house, a Broadway house. Mm -hmm. And they are the gatekeepers. So they decide ultimately what shows get mounted on Broadway and which ones don't. And sometimes you can go one or two or three seasons and not have a house. Sometimes you never get a house. Sometimes you get a house um, and you have to be able to get that good girl up and running in 12 weeks, which is not nearly enough time to be able to do all that necessary advertising and marketing because you want to be able to have that ticket, that show be so popular before it opens that people are rushing to buy tickets, right? Mm -hmm. If you want to, like I, I did, I was an investor in a show called A Fish in the Dark and it was a Larry David written mm -hmm. play, comedy. 
And all I heard was Larry David. And I said, I'm in. <laughs> because I knew that that show was, I didn't, I, didn't look at, I didn't look at the cover page. I didn't open a script. I didn't read anything. I went in completely blind. And that show fully recouped $18 million before the show even opened. Ooh, wow. So sometimes you're lucky enough to get, you know, a slant. Now, critically, it was, you know, but monetarily, did very, very well. Wow. Very, very well. Mm -hmm. Now, I guess, could you talk about, you know, I know Ain't Too Proud to Beg, right? Was, was uh, it's just Ain't Too Proud. The too proud. Of the temptation. Ain't Too Proud, that's all. Thank you, brother. <laughs> now, were you a lead producer on Ain't Too Proud? I was not. I was the first person that Tom and Ira approached to be a producer on the show. Mm -hmm. I mean, part of that is I had worked with Tom Holtz before in Seattle, Seattle Repertory Theater. He directed me in a show called um, The Cider House Rules. Yeah, cool. mm -hmm. And then we, do, we did a film together. And so we had a, a repertoire, you know, a repartee. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know much about Ira, though we were on another production together, but I, I, didn't, I didn't recall that. Um, but I think partially it was that they wanted to work with me and a part of it is, is that they need good optics because if you are putting on a black show and let's say you are nominated for a Tony Award and all you see is a sea of white people on stage, mm -hmm. people kind of get a little mm -hmm. rubbed the wrong way about that. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. I asked them about being a lead producer because I was so thrilled about the project and they were like, yeah, no, we're, we're good. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, I mean, I guess, can you talk about the th that path? Like, because that didn't have a direct path to Broadway, did it? I mean, you know, so I guess what were some of the challenges to, to getting it to Broadway? And was it always a, you know, a done deal that it would get there? Well, um, like most all musicals, there were years of development. It was years getting the rights because, um, you know, the rights from Motown, there was a show on Broadway called Motown. And so they had um, a lockdown from the rights that another show of that ilk could not be done for, I don't know, however many years. So mm -hmm. it, the, the ability to get the rights had to wait a number of years, number one. Number two, then once it was cleared to have something, then the producers actually went and found the writer to write the show. So this isn't one of these pieces that, that a writer said, hey, I wanna write a play about or a musical about blah, blah, blah. This was created uh, out of the brainchild of both of the lead producers. Mm -hmm. So they found the writer. They asked, in fact, it's funny, they asked me, I had lunch with them and they said, so who do you think would be a good person to write this? And I said, there's only one person because mm -hmm. she's, she's, she's smart, she's great, she's African-American, she's from Detroit. There ain't but one person needs to write this show. And it mm -hmm. turned out that they listened, thank God. Mm -hmm. um, and then it was about finding the choreographer. They had had conversations with the director, so they knew who the director was going to be. And then it was just a process of creating the story, the book for the musical. And that is a very iterative process. Like you, you read it and then you, you, know, you have some people come in. You read it alone individually with the core team. Then you have, you, as you expand the core team to include other people in the circle, excuse me, um, then they have the ability to give feedback and hopefully we'll be improving on the story at every iteration. Mm -hmm. We were writing that, okay, let me see. I wanna say it was two years before we did a presentation of the piece. And we did a presentation and we had music, we had live, um, orchestra, music, so forth and so on. We had uh, uh, set pieces, we had like stage management. So it was, though it, there was no, there, there was not all the costumes and there was not all the, the bells and whistles. It, you gave you a real sense of what the show was. Mm -hmm. And that happened and then we booked that out of town. Um, we had two theaters lined up, but then we got two offers for to other theaters out of town where it was gonna actually make money before coming to mm -hmm. New York. Because a lot of times there is what's called an enhancement deal where a play is works with a not-for-profit and the not-for-profit of course only has limited budgets for doing you know, a play or musical, whatever. So the producers enhance that. So that meant that, 
I want to say that we enhanced Ain't Too Proud to the tune of $12 million. Mm. But when you enhance a project at a not-for-profit or a regional theater, you get all the assets. You get the set, the lights, the costumes, oh, the props. See. You get, you can just pick, you put all that in a box and put it on some buses and you take it with you. To the next spot. To the next spot. And the reason you do that, of course, is because it's hella cheaper to create all that stuff in Berkeley, California, than it is here in New York City, because mm -hmm. the rates are so much more expensive here. Mm -hmm. um, so then after you get this puppy and we tour it, we would, in our case, we toured it to four different places, including Canada. Then um, we were like, OK, now we need a theater, right? And the last place we did it was in DC. And no theater owners were coming out to see this show. And it was, when I tell you it was a no, in my opinion, a no brainer that this was gonna be a hit. It was like as clear as a nose on your, I, for, to me, mm -hmm. I, I was like, I don't understand how these theater owners are not beating each other up trying to get this property. So mm -hmm. finally, when we got to DC, theater owners took it out of their time to come to DC to see the show. And then things started percolating. And then people started interest. And then within where it had been months and years before when the theater could have set aside a house for us like within a little over a month we had a we had a house mm. so that's the that's the journey of that show every show is different a little bit different mm. Mm. thank you um and you all you feel free to like just type in a, a question in the chat or so and i can call on you you know until then i'll just keep asking questions Ron, I'm wondering if you have thoughts, and I know there's no like easy path to, to anything, but like a, a young person who's like interested in being a producer, you know, like coming out of school, I guess, you know, how do you think, where would they start as far as trying to develop or build relationships towards being, a, because they're not gonna just graduate and then be a, a, a co-producer, you know what I'm saying? How, what might be one path or trajectory do you think of where they might go towards? Well, I would suggest that young producers focus on two things. One, you need a strong Rolodex because a good part of what you're going to do as a co-producer is raise money. So if you don't know have a Rolodex that is full of folks who can write you checks for $25,000, you need to develop that. You need to be going to what and how I did it as I started because I came from, I'm from an automotive family, so I knew nobody. Um, but I did, I was involved with a lot of not-for-profits, you know, and they have boards of directors. So I was, I was feeding off of the people on boards of directors because people who are not-for-profits who are on their boards usually have to write a check, a give get, where they have to bring $10,000 to the table, $25,000 to the table, whatever. Um, so you want to have a strong role a day. And it could be, you know, folks who you may not even realize could write you a check for that amount. It could be someone if you are in a sorority or a fraternity. And, you know, you guys get together and have soirees or events or whatever. Mm -hmm. It could be the elders in your church. It could be, you know, your uncle who, you know, works for a trust fund and might have some ducats to spare. Mm -hmm. Right. So you need to start building that relationship early on, because what you want to be able to do is not the first interaction with them. Hey, Ted, I want you to give me some money. You need to build a relationship where you give them something over time. So that when you come back and ask them for something, it's not a pattern of I, they, they give, they give, they give, they give, they give, they give. Mm -hmm. That's the one thing. Mm -hmm. The second thing is you re really need to network with everybody in this industry. You need to take meetings with as many directors as you possibly can get a hold of. You need to be going to readings all the time. Because even if the show is not good and the people who put on the show are not good in the audience are other co-producers. And you need to know other co-producers because those are the people who are your peers who are gonna come together to create the community to put on a show when you have a show. Mm -hmm. So it's really important that you get out there and know who the co-producers are that are working, the directors out there who are working. If you're closer to getting, um, having a show that might be looking like it'd be Broadway, you should be having co coffee, cocktails with the theater owners, you know, just to, just to get to know them, right? Um, so you really want to spend a lot of time, a couple of three years, if you come to New York, setting up calls, coffees, well now it's calls, but, it, but when I, back in the day, it was phone, it was an email, I mean email, it was coffee, tea, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and cocktails. 
Mm. You're going to spend a good amount of money, drink a whole lot of liquor <laughs> um, to build those relationships. But you have to have those relationships because being a nobody in this industry means it's going to be so much harder to get anything done. People do things because they like people. And that mm -hmm. is so true here in on Broadway in New York. Mm -hmm. I would also say you might want to learn what the hell it means to be producing. So there are ways to learn. There's a good book by CTI about uh, producing that I would encourage any of you guys who are interested in being a producer, you might want to read. Um, CTI is an, or it's called the Commercial Theater Institute. They also offer like a three-day class and they also like offer a 14-day class intensive where you meet every type of person involved in Broadway from, um, from producers to lawyers to theater owners to, I mean, just the wide array of people who make up Broadway. So that's one way to get your foot in the door because, because you know, I, I wasn't that smart. I just literally just jumped in and I didn't read a book, a pamphlet, a class, nothing. I don't think you should do that. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to wonder if I could bring in Mitch here as well, Mitch, if you if you don't mind, because, you know, Mitch, you Mitch is a, a, a general manager on on Broadway. And Mitch, I wonder if you would mind like just sharing what that is and what you know, what you might think of is a path for, you know, a person, a young person introduced interested in producing, you know, how they might go about getting involved in this community as well. Uh, well, first of all, uh, Ron, that was a great talk. I have to um, you, forgive me. You don't need my approval on any of this stuff. But first, I have to tell you, the number of producers I have worked with, 50% of them are complete idiots. <laughs> I am so happy to hear you talk and to explain things correctly and with experience, and I thank you for that. It, it was a delight for me to go, yeah, yeah, good for you, yeah. I was just thrilled. Yeah. Um, thank you, Mitch. thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. Um, I will speak on, on behalf of the management because when someone like Ron brings in the money, gets the show together, has the show picked out, I get hired to um, take his wishes and his dreams and make them a reality. My Rolodex, which of course is an old term, is uh, supposed to be like no other. So if Ron comes to me and says, I want Denzel Washington starring in this show, I have to know how to reach him, how to get to him immediately, how much he's going to cost, how I'm going to make it happen, and I have to be able to report back in 24 hours. So, and that goes with designers, directors, somebody may quit. Uh, we may want to fire someone. I have to know the union rules so that they can be fired and they can be replaced. I need to know what we can get away with and what we can't because uh, the goal isn't to try to cheat anybody. The goal is to just do what's going to be best for the show. And sometimes with an intelligent producer, it's the same thing, doing what the producer wants, not just what the what's good for the show. Mm -hmm. um, That's true. Mm -hmm. And so, I should also say, by the way, that a, a good general manager is a producer's best friend because they, they know, as Mitch said, they know all the rules and regulations for all of these unions. They've read all these APC. I didn't know what the hell an APC was, but like they read all these things that, 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 that you don't even know exist that control what you can do with certain people and how long they, it's, it's crazy. But a good general manager will make your life so much easier than if you're dealing with a mediocre one. Just, I, I just wanted to say no, that. No, I, I agree, which is, uh, and I've worked for both when I, um, there's the company manager who basically runs the show on a day-to-day -day basis once it's up. Does the payroll, pays the bills, knows where everything's hidden, knows who's pregnant and isn't telling you who's going to be leaving the wardrobe department and how we're going to replace them. The general manager hires the company manager. A uh, producer may approve it. Very often, they don't even know what they do, so they just go, yeah, sure, whatever. Um, but 
and the general manager is the one who's negotiating the contracts, uh, making sure everything's in place and all 200 staff members. And the most fun, I have to just throw this in, the most fun I have on any show is when someone hands me the checkbook, quote unquote, and says, here's $18 million, you have eight weeks, spend it. <laughs> wow. I mean, it's a joy. Now, of course, I also am responsible for every penny. I have to know where it goes. But that it, it's 24-7 for uh, weeks and weeks and weeks. And of course, the producer will walk in one day and say, uh, okay, um, how do we get the Schubert's to give us a theater? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, the general manager, I know how to call up the Schubert's and say, I need to talk to you. And then I need to come back and say to you, uh, it ain't gonna happen this year. And then you're gonna either fire me because you don't believe me, <laughs> or we're going to come up with a new plan. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's expensive and you're right. And it's years and years and years. And by the way, a shout out to uh, Gwen Gamel, who's in the group here. Uh, Gwen is interning with me right now. Oh. And I wanted to, I wanted to give you a shout out, Mitch, because Mitch is one of our esteemed alums. And you are, you have to, you know, you've had a, a number of of Oberlin students and recent graduates. You know, like Jad, I think Jad Keis, right, was was working right. with you. And I wonder if you could just talk about like what what Oberlin students have done with you or for you. You know, when they come. <laughs> well, first, and and Jakeem uh, Wheat, Wheatley, uh, who's now in law school in Chicago, trying to do entertainment law. Mm -hmm. And so he was also an intern. Uh, the, first of all, remotely, Gwen's the first one I've, I don't know how we do internships remotely. And especially there's no theater. I can't walk her backstage and say, look at what a Broadway show looks like. And this is how all 200 people are working together. So she's, uh, you know, we're, we're coming up with new methods and, and plans. Um, but the, you know, I'm, I'm very partial to Oberlin students. I think they're a cut above. Um, they, uh, don't, I, I don't have to explain a lot. It doesn't mean they know everything, but there's a lot of self motivation in Oberlin students, which is why, um, my entire company has been thrilled working with them. Basically, I mean, I've had one student, uh, one intern from Baruch, who's also wonderful. I don't want to downplay everybody, <laughs> but I'm I'm thrilled about Oberlin. Um, they, uh, if theater were going on now, they would all be working in theater. I believe that they would all have jobs. I know Jad um, came this close to being the assistant to a phenomenal Broadway ma uh, general manager, but theater died. So he had to grab another job mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or went into coma or whatever. Right. Anyway. Well, I mean, I guess on that note, you know, what do you all, you know, what's your thoughts on this current shutdown, you know, and are you hopeful or scared about what's coming next, you know, or, you know, both? Well, I, I think that's a question for Ron. He's got money in this. I, I just have to take care of myself um and you know some of my projects right well you know what here's the thing it depends i feel differently about different shows mm -hmm. right because ain't too proud was open and running gangbusters big hit peeling off checks every couple of months we love that and i set up my entire life around those checks income and then it was gone so for that show what I'm really excited about is when it's safe to reopen, I have no idea what that means in terms of logistics. Does that mean like every third seat is empty? You know, does that mean, I, I know they're talking about putting in filtration systems for the air, you know, they're gonna be requiring people to wear masks. Um, I, if they're, if it's true that a vaccine may be available by the end of the year, then, you know, that's where the clock starts. And maybe in six months, if its efficacy is strong enough, you know, people will feel more comfortable sitting in a theater with 600 people they never met before, mm -hmm. right? So 
what I'm concerned about, honestly, is for my shows when they reopen, like Ain't Too Proud, is how much additional cost it's going to take require of us mm -hmm. to have people, I don't know, check temperatures at the door, you know, to, you know, manage the lines for the restrooms at intermission. Because if you've ever been to a Broadway show, usually they have like maybe two, the uh, two restrooms and those are long lines and people are right up against each other all the way down the stairs. And I don't know what you do with all of those people at an intermission, you know, when you can't, ha you have to have them social distancing, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm concerned about that. I'm also concerned about will there be some concessions from the unions? Because, you know, a, a Mitch can tell you that a big chunk of money that we spend goes toward the unions of the various unions that, that put on our shows. Will they be willing to provide some concessions? I know that we are, have, um, uh, with Ain't Too Proud, we've negotiated regarding royalties with um, those creative members who have royalties. And so we they've agreed to hold off on receiving royalties until the until we recoup our investment for the investors plus their profit. Um, and also, so, it, so that's for that show. That's a very different show than saying um, Thoughts of a Colored Man. Mm -hmm. Thoughts of a Colored Man has no local national press. It was not open before. Most people will not. So we have to build that audience, build that audience from ground zero. And I'm also nervous about the fact that for Broadway, 70% of our revenues come from tourists. Mm -hmm. And I just don't think that people are going to be rushing to get on a plane with the you know three kids in tow to go to New York to see a show when you may have been digging into your, your savings just to survive. Mm -hmm. And even if you do have the resources, how comfortable are you gonna feel again by coming into a theater? And, so the whole industry has to focus on making people feel comfortable. And so for my show, I'm at least when we reopen at first, I think we're gonna have to rely on the tri-state area theater goers to come out in droves mm -hmm. uh, because I don't think we're gonna have a lot of tourists coming to see the show until they are ready, willing, and able to, tra to travel here and sit in our theaters to watch our shows. Mm -hmm. That's very different than let's say uh, a, a show that doesn't have a theater yet, mm -hmm. but are close to it because guess what? You get to sit in the wings and see how all that everybody else figures this out, right? Mm -hmm. You can see what, is it, what, what, what does attendance look like? Because you know, we track all that stuff. And you know, are are there shows that are getting you know sellouts given the new model, whatever the model is? Mm -hmm. But one of the areas that I think is going to do well is going to be touring companies, because mm -hmm. I think when I think of Ain't Too Proud, which we were supposed to have already been on tour now, and and that show going out around the country, I think that it is more likely that people in any given city would say. Um, you know what, I heard they have this Temptations play down at the, at the Pantages. Mm -hmm. We should go see it. You don't have to get on a plane. You don't have to pay for a hotel. You feel comfortable. You've been in that theater before. So you there's some kind of familiarity. So my, I say it is in my mind, it's like, we're not going to bring Muhammad to the mountain. We're going to bring the mountain to Muhammad in Cincinnati mm -hmm. and in San Francisco and in all the other cities, you know, around the markets that we're we're, we're, we're uh, planning to be in. So I think that will actually do better early on than shows on the Great White Way. Mm, thank you. Hey, I wanna, you know, as we're kind of getting close towards the end, I wanna make sure that I get to introduce you to some of the leadership in our, in our department. Um, Eric Stiegel, are you there, Eric? Can you- Yeah, I'm here. Well, yeah, hey, hey. Hey, everybody. Hey, Mitch, how you doing? How's it going, man? <laughs> Hey, hey, Eric, how are you? Nice to see you. Because we, you know, we dreamed a little bit, perhaps, about Ron maybe coming back and doing a longer, you know, something. Yeah. In your lectureship, or I don't know, something for a week or a month or something, you know, in in in, in producing or administration it would be great. So I just want to, you know, also just kind of so you all can see each other, and also our department chair, Ron, is Caroline Jackson Smith. You'll see there. Hey, welcome. So great to see you and to have you here with us. Thank you, Carolyn. Nice to meet you too, Eric. Nice to and who is also a native of Detroit. Caroline, yes, Ron is also. Yes, my whole family. I didn't personally grow up there, but I might as well have 
whole yeah. family there. And they will definitely come see Dominique's play because right? they Absolutely. already uh, publicize every single thing Dominique does. So. Good, good. She's a hometown girl. Hometown and girl. Seriously. Oh my God. Well, <laughs> on that note, then I got to say, I spent 10 years in Dearborn Heights. My you father sure? was a proud really? Ford Motor Company. Yeah, yeah. Wow. What were you doing for Ford Motor Company? Well, my father, head of security for Ford Motor Company. Uh, World headquarters. Wow. Okay. Another down, down home, uh, hometown boy. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, I see we got some folks. Anybody, any questions, y'all, out there? Uh, D-Way, Cyril, y'all want to introduce yourself? Alex, y'all theater folk? I'll say hi. Um, <clears throat> hi, Ron. I'm Cyril. Um, I'm one of the student reps in the department and uh, playwright, actor, director um, in the department. Triple threat. Very, very talented. Very talented, uh, uh, you know, writer working on a musical right now as you speak. Got got some nice vision for it. Oh, yeah. 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 Just <laughs> all right. All right. What's, what's, your, what's your musical about, Cyril? Uh, my musical is a take on Greek mythology. Um, it's called Olympus, and it's basically the story. I've made a play on the story of Hephaestus, Aphrodite, and Ares. They've always had this like love triangle in Greek mythology. So now it's about, I've added some other gods, added some more music. So these eight kind of Black immortal teenagers almost are kind of coming up in the world and trying to change the game and trying to change how this city and this town has been crafted with that kind of focus on that little love triangle thing. So um, a lot of like rap, uh, a lot of R&B. It's my of musical. It's the next Hamilton, baby. It's the next <laughs> Hamilton. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That D-way? sounds awesome, Cyril. That really does sound like a cool project. We have some other writers here too. Olivia D-Way. Um, Introduce yourselves, yep. Yeah. Hi. Hi, I'm D-Way. Um, I'm from Cleveland. Yeah, I'm a third year. I'm a poet, writer. Right now I'm writing with Miss Caroline in our internship and trying to go through everything I've written. But I have written a few plays in the past. I mean, like one play, actually. It was about, <laughs> I was trying to bring the character Topsy back to life, like in a modern setting and explore like what that would be like under the purview of like what, I don't know white cis hetero patriarchy like expects of you and like to rebel against that and like what that means to like still be black excellent but not acceptable i guess yeah it's um it's a work in progress it's very uh <laughs> it's very um uh, yeah it's a work in progress at the moment it's kind but of but i love that i love that you guys are writing you know unconventional stories like that's the kind of stories that are going to be driving this industry. You know what I mean? Yeah. Hey, Olivia, shouting out Olivia Huntley. Come on and say hi. What's up? <laughs> Hello. I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah. Um, my name is Olivia Huntley, and I'm also one of the students working with Miss Caroline for the Oberlin College Junior Practicum Research Track. Um, all of us are working on plays. My play focuses on um the pandemic second wave in 1918 chicago and the race riots that followed the next summer um starting off the red summer that lasted from 1919 until 1921 notably including the tulsa massacre um it all really focuses around one family and thinking of what it means to learn from the people who've come before us who are living in similar times and how they were able to address their relationships with each other and a time that often felt even more uncertain than it had been in the past. Um, so there's a lot of thinking about what it means to deal with an intergenerational Black community that's on the brink of change in ways that wouldn't have been anticipated in, in decades prior. Okay, listen. <laughs> These kids ain't messing around. You hear me? They are not messing around. They are writing some intelligent stories that have that are relevant and yeah. interesting and untold. That's right. 
that's a ma- okay. I'm sorry, I didn't even go. I, I'm just no, really- no, that's right. And you know, we have people like Max Ade out there, who's a musical genius, and yeah. Alex Howell, who's actually studying management in a lot of different ways. Oh, good, Alex. Say hello. That. You, you Come and- on, y'all, jump say on and say hi. Say hello. Introduce. Say what you're interested in. Hi, uh, my name is Alex Howell, and like Justin said, I in the chairline said I'm studying stage management, production management, um, hoping to go that route. Um, when I graduate in the spring. Yeah. Amazing. You're almost, you're almost out of there. Yep. I am. <laughs> yep. My first, his first year, he came in, in, in main in stage manager, main stage production, which is kind of unheard of, you know, first semester, first year, my production of bluest eye and Alex was a professional, professional first year. And now he's a senior. And so now even four times better. So <laughs> right now, go ahead, Alex. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Jeff. I had a great mentor through that. Yes. Amazing. Amazing. Wow. So great. Anybody <laughs> else want to say anything? Oh, I see my uh, other yeah colleague, incredible colleague, Johnny Coleman on here. He's a professor in the Africana Studies Department and an art professor. I uh, might be the art chair right now. I don't know. He's always been chair, you know, been chair of the art department. Hey, Johnny, you want to say anything? I like his portrait or whoever that what, is. What's yeah. happening, y'all? I'm sitting here in the dark, so I'm just going to, I'm I'm not going to put the camera on because you wouldn't see me anyway, except a little gleam in my glasses. So <laughs> and it's a real pleasure listening to your trajectory. I, 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 I found all of it resonant to, to hear some of the backstory and how this works in terms of getting a vision and idea from um, from the rooter to the tutor and to, and to make it work. Yeah. Um, and also it really it really resonated with me to hear your story about having been so engaged in a completely other career and trajectory and to actually have uh, the integrity and the courage to step away and and take that chance. I, you know, I wrote something a little while ago in the chat that said, you know, uh, you're stepping out on faith. You have to learn how to fall and um, be willing to fail. And um, I had a very similar experience and uh, I just wish I'd done it sooner, but I wasn't ready, you know? Me too, me too. Yeah. I wish I'd done it sooner as well. But you know what? I'm a firm believer as that everything happens when it's supposed to happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. The main but, thing I want people to recognize and remember, no matter how old you are, is that anyone ever tells you, oh, it's too late for you to do X, Y, Z. Don't listen to them. I mean, life is a gift. Yeah. Go for it. Follow your passion. Absolutely. Don't let anyone take away your passion. Period. 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 <laughs> Nothing to add. Lauren Elwood making an original piece right now. Where are you? Come on, introduce Lauren. Come on, Lauren. <laughs> Hello. Hi, I'm. Thank you again for um, talking. I've also was quite inspired by the non-traditional like trajectory. But I, I am a fourth year Ayushi Herhers. I am a actor, choreographer at this moment, also a director. Um, I also am very into administrative work and like publicity work. Um, my piece, which is my which is my capstone, is um, taking a look at a lot of different things. Um, it's called Big Spender, uh, Fosse, Camming, and all that jazz. Um, so I'm taking sort of the direct. <laughs> it's devised. It's a musical theater dance film <laughs> set in um, the um, virtual space of like cam modeling, cam work, it's um, mm-hmm. virtual sex work um, and sort of exploring the different ways um, both, sorry, I'm nervous, I'm excited. Right. <laughs> we don't gotta be nervous about it. We, look, we just have a little kiki as my friend said, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, well, I finished filming for it um, oh, wow, that's three, three days after this talk, we have <laughs> rehearsal um, filming right at six. Um, so it it's taking sort of a look at like all these different performers lives. And um, uh, I, I, I've been thinking a lot about like, th- there's sort of the element of the performer and also the perf- <laughs> the performer and um, there's like a double, they're creating characters and they're also creating like 
these personas that they're portraying. So there's like this sort of double um, consciousness. Yes, one could say, <laughs> um, not in quite the same way, but yeah. And then also sort of exploring sort of the inherent um, like male gaze that is sort of perpetuated and like, can you distance yourself from that within sort of your movement or can you escape it? Can you not? Um, that is very much not as concise as I was talking about it this morning in one of my classes, but that's sort of like the broad scope and using Fosse's um, work and um, vocabulary as a jumping off point. Interesting. Yes. Thank you. Thank wow. You. Go ahead with your bad self. <laughs> Lisa, I'm wondering, Gwen, I see Gwen Gamel's on the, on the line and you're doing an internship with, with Mitch this semester. I'm wondering if you could just speak a little bit about how that's going and what you, you know, what you've been able to do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I've been working with Mitch. Um, we're working on, well, like developing um, different um, like commissions and stuff like that. So we have um, through his uh, production team, we're developing different um, different uh sorry i'm nervous as well um <laughs> <laughs> anyway um different um broadway shows that could go towards broadway to be um like picked up by bigger producers um which is exciting and really cool i've had to like i've got to like look at like scripts that are in development um help with like any thoughts that i have um it's really nice to like feel very engaged with things, even if it is like a remote type thing. Um, just like kind of having that like hands-on work other than like, like I know he said earlier that I can't like go behind the stage and like witness stuff like that. But I think it's cool to be able to like see things in the early stages of development um, within like shows. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, that's mainly what I've been doing. Um, also just working on like other small things or like writing press releases. Um, reading about the Broadway industry and like the business side of things. Um, yeah, so I, I think it's been a really informative experience for me. Um, so yeah, that's that's mainly what I wanted to that's say. That's great, that's great. I'm so excited to hear people who are pursuing, you know, roles in theater beyond just producer, actor. I mean, none of those aren't important roles, mm -hmm. but I think a lot of times I meet a lot of people who don't even know what other possible professions there are that need to be filled in theater. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So this is encouraging. Mm -hmm. It is. It's really been a great afternoon. And yeah, just, you know, as, as Ron and Mitch both said, the importance of relationships and really to not forget how much of a resource you all for each other are. Amen. And to make sure that you're aware of each other uh, because you all are going to move up as a group and as a cohort, you know. Um, so it's just good to, to, to just you all help each other out and listen and support each other's work. Mm -hmm. I would say one of the points that I would like to point on is that, you know, no matter where you are, no matter what group that you are in, even if you're tired and you really don't feel like being bothered with anybody, I would say. I, it, what it is doing is networking, but I hate that word networking because then it makes it sound like I got to go in and talk to a whole bunch of people I don't know about some things that I don't care nothing about. But that's not the case. It's a mindset. When you walk into a room, think to yourself, I wonder if there's anybody in here I might want to be friends with. That's your jumping off point, right? And so then you can just come up to people and say, hey, so what do you do when you're not here? You know, washing windows or whatever they're doing. And literally have honest, sincere, exploratory conversations with people because you never know. You never know who that person is that you're talking to or who they might be able to introduce you to. Mm -hmm. And if you build these relationships over time and you have a rich network, you'll be just fine. <laughs> Ooh, on that note, yes, let's all give Ron a hand. And big money, big money, big money. Thank y'all. Thank you so much for coming through, Ron. It's been wonderful. Oh, look at that. They can clap in the windows. How do they do that? <laughs> wow. We so, old. we so old, Ron. Come on, man. We so old. <laughs> I didn't know you can clap in a window. What the hell? Nobody told me nothing. <laughs> wow. That's all right. Thank you, Marcy. Is that Marcy from Pittsburgh? Good to see you. Hey, how are you? Welcome. Yes, welcome. Yeah, and you know what, Justin, I just wanted to say, um, I'm here to support Justin. He, I'm a, I'm from the Pittsburgh Public Theater Emeritus on the board, and Justin is our resident director. Yay. 
Um, and I want to echo um, Ron, wonderful, wonderful lessons. I want to echo what Ron said. You never know who's in the room. Um, I don't have the capacity to write a lot of checks, but I have the capacity to introduce a lot of people. And that's what you need. You do it in college, and then you got to remember that skill when you get out of college. And you got to use it over and over and over. And guess what? In theater, what everybody in the room loves theater. So you all have that in common right away. So thank you all. Thank you, Marcy, for speaking up. Thank you so much for joining us. Yes, thank, thank you for that. Thank you. All right. Well, this has been great. So thank you guys so much for inviting me. It was so great. I feel like there's some amazing powerhouses on this call. I yeah. cannot wait to leave. This work is developed. I'm going to be able to say, oh, <laughs> I knew Teresa back in the day. Eric and I, we go way back. Cool. Oh, Gwen, <laughs> that's my girl. So <laughs> keep it up. Thank you. thank you, brother. Much love and respect to all. Thank Peace you for coming. Thank you. Thank you so much for having. Be well, Al. Bye. Thank you.